Well, good morning, church. How we doing? Good. Hey, you're here. You made it through spring break, time change, rodeo, and uh, I'm going to just go ahead as I'm talking this morning. I want to give a quick shout out to my online family because I'm sure there are some extra people on there this morning than would normally be. But hey, it's a good day to be here, good day to be in church. So thank you so much for being here. I want to start this morning with a simple question. What is truth? You don't have to answer it out loud. Just, just think about that for a second. And I want you to think about the fact that the world has all kinds of answers for you. But I did the hard work for you, okay? You get to be a little lazy this morning. I asked Google what truth was. And Google, in point five five seconds, a little over half a second, gave me 3,310,000,000 different answers for what truth was. Now, these answers range from everything from verbal definitions all the way to attempts at explaining the meaning of the universe. But then the majority of them were somewhere, you know, kind of in between these. But for the sake of getting you out on time to actually eat some lunch today, <laughs> I'm not going to share three billion definitions with you. I know, I know, so sad. I'm going to give you one, though. Webster's Dictionary defines truth as, are you ready? What's true? That's the actual definition of it. What's true? It's shocking, right? But more specifically, Webster's Dictionary defines truth that it's tied to this idea of fact or reality. And so the truth, if it's truth, means that it's not subjective or based on belief. Truth is reality whether you believe it or not. And so if someone is speaking about truth or of truth, then they're actually speaking with an authority that goes beyond doubt, goes beyond questioning. And you may have a little red flag pop up in your head, a little light bulb that goes, hey, I don't know if there's anybody who can speak with such absolute assurance. I mean, who could speak knowing that what they were saying was 100% without a doubt true to the point that nobody could even question it? And if you're asking that question, it's a good question to ask. But I also think the answer is a little bit more simple than we think it is. So who can speak with an authority that can't be questioned? How about the creator of the universe? How about the living word of God himself? Jesus. Jesus said this about himself in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And so as we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount for these past few weeks, you may notice something about Jesus, that his words, they aren't opinions and arguments against a broken religious system. They're truth. That Jesus' words, they're authoritative and final. And so where other rabbis or Jewish teachers give their interpretation of God's law, Jesus gives an authoritative and final word on what life and faith looks like. And these statements that Jesus makes all throughout this sermon wouldn't have been very easy to hear. And so if you were sitting in the crowd, there's plenty of people in the crowd who would have been made very uncomfortable by some of the things that Jesus has said. And if you've been here with us for the past, the past few weeks as we walk through the sermon, there's a really good chance that maybe you've been made uncomfortable by some of the things that Jesus has said. And if that's happened, then I'd say, good. That was the goal of Jesus as he gave this sermon. And it's been our heart and prayer as we've walked through this series with you that you would think a little bit harder about your life and your faith and that that would lead you to obedience to God. And so as we continue this morning in Upside Down, we're going to look at this concept of truth this morning. And specifically, I want to talk to you about the main idea that you can't change the truth of Jesus, but you can let the truth of Jesus change you. So, if you've got your Bibles or Bible apps this morning, you can turn to Matthew 7. That's where we're going to be today. And we're going to start by looking at verses 13 and 14. And this is what it says. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So by this point in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is kind of getting towards the end of his message. And he starts this section off by talking about the wide gate and the narrow gate. And in order for us to really understand what the narrow gate is, 
you need to understand what Jesus has been doing with his message up to this point. Now, when Jesus starts his ministry, we know that happens after the temptation in the wilderness in Matthew 4. And he makes his first public statement in Matthew 4, 17. And he said this, he said, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is it near. So this is the first public statement of ministry that we have of Jesus. He says, repent and believe the good news, the kingdom of heaven is coming. Now, if you're the crowds that he's speaking to in this moment, I imagine that you probably would have been a little bit excited. I mean, think about being a Pharisee for a minute. You would be thinking, finally, a Jew that gets it. More rules, more sacrifice, more than turn back to God, baby. He's got it. So give me a little more truth, Jesus. And so you join this crowd as they follow Jesus up this mountainside, and you sit, excited to hear some truth from Jesus. But as Jesus starts talking, something changes. You start to hear Jesus talk about forgiveness in ways you've never heard before. You start to hear Jesus talk about the fact that faith is not about rules, but it's about a relationship with God. Jesus says that God's more interested in the condition of your heart than he is your, your outward appearance to others. But at the same time, he calls you to a level of obedience and sacrifice way greater than anything they've been called to up to this point. It's upside down. It's a little uncomfortable. And so I can only imagine that there were people in the crowds at this moment who thought, you know what? This is his interpretation of the law. This is his interpretation of faith. I'm going to decide what that really means for me. And maybe there's some of you who do the same thing. Maybe you like the idea of Jesus. Maybe you like the idea of following Jesus. But there's aspects of that that make you a little uncomfortable. And so what you want to do is you want to kind of pick and choose what little bits of Jesus you take with you. So maybe you like the Savior part, but this whole sacrifice deal, mm -mm, that's too personal, too convicting. Like, I don't want that, so I'll just take the Savior part, Jesus. I'm okay with that. But that's not how this works. We don't get to pick and choose what pieces of the gospel and God's word and message that we believe. See, the reality is, is that if Jesus is absolute truth, then his message is too. You can't change absolute truth. And so as uncomfortable as it was, this was Jesus' message. That's why he calls it the narrow path, that it's not easy. And so when we talk about faith and we talk about the gospel, you need to understand the idea that the gospel should be both comfortable and uncomfortable. And I know some of you probably just perked up a little bit and you're thinking, Chris, clearly you have to see the contradiction in what you just said. Comfortable, uncomfortable. How can Jesus comfort me into being uncomfortable. It doesn't make sense. It's got to be one or the other, right? No. And I'll tell you why. Here's the comfort of the gospel. Jesus loves you despite who you are. In fact, Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. Romans 5.8 says that but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus, he loved you so much that he left the perfection of heaven. He came down born as a baby boy. He lived life. He's tempted in the same ways that we were, but he lives a perfect life. And he doesn't stop there. He goes to the cross. He dies on the cross as payment for our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. And he doesn't stop there. Three days later, he rises from the grave. All throughout this process, Jesus has not only lived the life that we could never live, he paid the price we could never pay, atonement, and he provides forgiveness of sins, a clean slate with God. And he does all of this because he loves you and he wants a relationship with you. That's the comfort of the gospel. But now here's the uncomfortable part. If you believe that, and you accept that, now you have to die to yourself. 
Romans 6, 1 through 4 says this. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace, grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So Paul's saying, look, if you have faith and it's genuine faith, that faith leads to repentance. And if you don't know what that means, repentance in a nutshell is essentially a complete change. It's this idea that everything about your life, your thoughts, your actions, your priorities, your beliefs, it's as if there was a 180 degree turn, a complete turnaround from what your life looked like before. And this idea of repentance, it goes all the way back to the very first command that Jesus gave. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so repentance, this is a crucial step of obedience that's a part of our faith. It's what makes our faith an active faith, and it's the first step that we take. And we see this the first time that the gospel is presented by Peter in Acts. This is the response that he gives of what you should do. In Acts 2, he says, when the people have heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what do we do? So they say, look, we heard the gospel. What now? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you repent, you have faith, boom, salvation. It's that simple, right? But repentance, it's not a one-time act. See, repentance, it's a daily choice to make the sacrifice, to die to your own desires in pursuit of the will of God. And making that choice every single day, it will be a sacrifice for you. Paul refers to this as dying to yourself because it hurts. It's costly. It's not easy to follow the will of God. And so it's not that hard to see why Jesus refers to this message as the narrow path that few find. So if it's hard, if it's difficult to live in the will of God, why do it? Look back at verse 13 with me. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, And broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Now, when you hear that word destruction, some of you may get this imagery, this idea of kind of that turn or burn message back in the day, the old school preaching. You know, it's that hellfire and brimstone and the wrath of God poured out on sinners. But that's not really what Jesus is talking about here. See, that word that Jesus uses for destruction here is a Greek word called apolia. And that word means to be cut off or severed from what could or should have been. And so what's interesting about this word of destruction is that it doesn't refer to this idea of annihilation or being wiped out like maybe you think it does. But rather, Apollia deals with this idea that your life is left in ruins, that it's left in shambles, that your life is just a shell of what it was supposed to be. And this idea it carries on into eternity as you remain cut off from everything God designed and created you for. And so as Jesus talks about the things of this world, of this wide path, he's warning us. He says, look, the things of this world, they're going to promise you life. They're going to promise you the same life that I offer, but they can't do it. They constantly will lead you to death. And here's the danger with the things of this world. They're really appealing at first. Jesus doesn't call the things of the world the wide path for just any reason. They seem desirable. And what's so dangerous about the wide path is that it often sings a sweet song of destruction. Solomon talked about this in Proverbs 5, 1 through 6. He said, my son, pay attention to my wisdom Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. 
But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her step leads straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she doesn't know it. And so Solomon, he writes this to his son to say, look, you've got to have discretion and wisdom with the things of this world. And so for us, we need to pay attention to this because I understand that you may be thinking, look, I don't really run into adulterous women all the time, so I don't know if this is about me. But the adulterous woman is a metaphor. She's a metaphor for sin and worldly desires, the temptations that we go through. And the reason that Solomon says that we need to be wise and have discretion with this is that they're very desirable at first, but they lead to death. And so what we often do is that we seek these things for the temporary rewards and pleasures they provide, but we're sacrificing our life in order to get them. So maybe... You're not looking for an adulterous woman. But maybe you've tried to find life in the bottom of a bottle. Maybe you've tried to find this life and this fulfillment through the title on your business card or the number of figures in your bank account or the relationship status in your social media bio. Maybe you thought that if you could just change who you were, change everything about you, that you'd feel accepted, that you belong, and everything would change. Or maybe you thought that just by having your freedom to do whatever you wanted to do, you'd feel alive. But you don't. You feel dead, you feel empty, hollow inside as you pursue the very things that Jesus so often refers to as meaningless, the things that perish. See, the reality is is that all these things that we chase after, they will never give you life, but they will lead you to destruction. They're false. And so here's what you have to do. If all you've been doing up to this point is chasing down this wide path and it's led you nowhere but to emptiness and ruin, turn back to the narrow way. Turn back to truth. Look what Jesus says in verse 14. He says, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. See, here's the truth, the absolute reality of the gospel is that Jesus, he brings life. And Jesus doesn't just bring life. He is the only way to life. He is the narrow and small gate. He is the only way, the only truth, the only life. And see, that life that Jesus provides, it's not just eternal life. That is a part of it. But if you look at this Greek word that he uses for life, it actually translates best to this idea of a fullness of life, that there is fulfillment in Jesus. And so he's saying, look, all these things that you chase after, this fulfillment, this purpose, this desire that you have in your heart, you chase after it in the world, but you find it in your sacrifice. That we find life in repentance and faith to Jesus. And we find the fulfillment, the fullness of life that we so desperately desire by living in obedience to God. It sounds so upside down, doesn't it? How can you be a slave to righteousness and find freedom? How can you be dead to yourself and find life? It's not always easy to understand and it's hard to follow, but it's truth. It's the gospel. It's life. And so what we do is we repent of our sins. We put our faith in Jesus because that's eternal life. And we die to ourself. We make the choice to live according to the will of God because that is the fulfillment and purpose that we have in our heart that's fulfilled through Jesus. It's not easy, but it's worth the sacrifice we make. 
All right, let's look at the next section. This is verse 15. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So as Jesus starts this section, right, he's been talking about truth, and now he makes this little bit of a shift here. And he says, look, you need to watch out. You need to be careful. Why? Because the truth of Jesus, it's hard to hear. And it's harder to follow. And the thing about this is, is that people in this world, there are people who are going to try and twist and distort the hard truth of Jesus' message into a palatable false gospel that fits their desires and their beliefs. And so this is where we have to start practicing discretion and wisdom and testing and approving because here's the reality you face, whether you realize it or not, is there are people in this world who will outwardly tell you that they are leading you to Jesus and they're leading you to destruction. And if you think that's not a problem today, if you think, man, I don't think we deal with false prophets, I got a a little bit of a wake-up call for you this morning. We live in the day and the age of false prophets, man. Stages and crowds are bigger than ever. And anybody with a phone and internet connection can share with you their interpretation of truth. So it's incredibly important for us to think through this and test and approve. Because I'm going to tell you, you'll find false prophets right here in Houston whether you realize it or not. There are churches here and pastors that will preach to you a gospel of prosperity, that Jesus, man, he just wants you to be successful and happy. And so all this, all this sacrifice and suffering, that's, that's not Jesus' message, right? He wants you to be healthy and wealthy. How does that fit with the message of the Sermon on the Mount? How does that reflect on the life that Jesus lived? or the sacrifice that Jesus made. It doesn't. But there are other churches that'll tell you, hey, salvation's not enough. Faith in Jesus, not enough. You're gonna have to earn it, you're gonna have to work for it, you're gonna have to take extra steps to get it. And here's what I say to that. If that's true, then what is the point of Jesus dying on the cross? Is his sacrifice not the totality of forgiveness and newness that we find in Jesus? It nullifies everything that he did. And yet there are other churches who will tell you, you know what? Hey, you just stay exactly like you are. Because Jesus loves you just the way you are. And he don't call you to change. And to that, I say, how does that compare to the message of repentance and sacrifice, and this idea of the narrow way that Jesus preaches of. It doesn't make sense. See, these are false gospels. And there's, there's plenty of other examples I could give you about this. But here's what all this boils down to, this idea, okay, is that if any church or pastor or leader or person who's discipling you preaches any other message to you other than repentance and faith in Jesus, because that is the gospel, If it's anything other than that, here's what you need to know. They are a false prophet, and they are a pathway to destruction. It's not my words. It's the words of Jesus. It's also the words of Paul. Look at Galatians 1, 8 through 9 with me. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. Again, I say to you, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So here's a little bit of a harsh reality for you. If anybody, and I want you to pay attention to that word, anybody, preaches a gospel other than repentance and faith, that includes Nathan, it includes me, it includes anybody who stands on this stage. If we ever do that, have nothing to do with us. If someone does that, you run far, you run fast, you do not trust them. Because Jesus says they may look like a sheep, but they're a vicious wolf faking it. And so this is why we have to learn to practice discretion, to practice wisdom, to be able to test and approve. And in order for you to do that, you need to know what truth is. You need to be in God's word. Paul says in Romans 12 too, that if we are transformed by the renewal of our mind, that we get the ability to test and approve what is God's will. And so we can discern what is good and what is God's will. And so we can do this with people as well. 
And so I want to remind you that wide is the gate that leads to destruction. There will be so many messages you will hear, but there's only one truth. Now, Jesus also says that, hey, you'll know them by their message, but he says you'll also know them by their fruit. Look at verses 16 through 20 with me. He says, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by your fruit, you'll recognize them. So Jesus says, look, when you're talking about false prophets, you'll know them by their talk, but you'll also know them by their walk. And so I want to give you just a little bit of a challenge this morning on this. When you're looking at voices of influence in your life, I want you to understand that someone's following or gifts or charisma, speaking ability, any of these things, that is not a mark of God working in their lives. Jesus says you will know them by their fruit, not their gifts. And so we need to practice discretion and look at the people that are leading us. And so there's questions you need to ask about this. First, what do they look like off the stage or from behind the pulpit? And with that question, you need to ask this, do they embody the fruit of the spirit that Jesus says is a part of who we are if you're a Christian? Are they loving? Are they peaceful? Are they peacemakers? Are they joyful? Do they handle situations with gentleness? Are they patient? Are they kind? Are they good-hearted? Are they faithful to God, to their church, and to their family? Do they practice self-control? And not just that, but do they embody all of the fruit of spirit or just some of them? And with that, there's other questions you need to ask. Are they building disciples of Christ or followers of their name? Are they a lover of money? Are they faithful to their spouse if they're married? If they have kids, are they a good parent? Are they a good shepherd of their congregation? Do they take care of their people or do they take advantage of them? Are they building their kingdom or the kingdom? I say all of this because wide is the gate that leads to destruction. See, here's the reality. Can't change the truth of, mess- the truth of Jesus. But you can let the truth of Jesus change you. And so we should be changed by the message, not the other way around. And so you need to test and approve the people you listen to. Listen to the gospel that they preach. Listen to the message they bring to you. But also look at how they live it out. Practice this discernment. Practice this wisdom with this. And if you'll do that, here's what you'll find. You'll find yourself being led by people that lead you to the truth and lead you to be changed by the truth of Jesus, not people who change the truth of Jesus. Practice discernment. So let's look at our last section together. This is verses 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So as we study this last section together, it's worth asking the question, what what has been Jesus' whole goal throughout the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount? See, Jesus, he's been preaching this hard truth of the narrow way. And here's what you got to remember about Jesus. He's not a pull your punches kind of guy. It's a hard hitting message and it hits home a lot. So put yourself in the crowd for a minute. What do you do with a truth like this? Can't change it. It's truth. But here's what you can do. You can be changed by it. See, the whole goal, the overarching goal of what Jesus has been doing 
is he's been trying to get people to think. He's been trying to get you to think about your life and your faith and eternity. And so as Jesus does this, he gives this kind of shocking example. He says, look, there are people who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. There are people who will think they are doing the right things, going the right way, leave themselves right to death. And he goes on, he gives them two different examples here. He says, look, you have one person who acknowledges Jesus. He says, hey, you're Lord. And Jesus says, dude, you don't have a relationship with me. But you also have this other guy who says, look at all the things I did for you. Look at all the good things. I prophesied, I cast out demons, I did miracles in your name. And Jesus says, that's great. But you didn't have a relationship with me. You didn't even know me. Neither of these people got in. Jesus' whole point here is that if you miss the goal of the gospel, you miss life. Life is found in faith in Jesus. It's repentance and faith. It's the narrow way. That's it. And so as Jesus is talking to this crowd, he's trying to get them to think. Will I enter the kingdom of heaven? Or have I gotten it all wrong? That of all the things that Jesus said and all the things that Jesus taught, what do I need to change to walk down this narrow road that Jesus speaks of? It's the same thing we have to ask ourselves. Will you enter the kingdom of heaven? Have you gotten it all wrong? Look, I don't, I don't have an interesting or captivating story to end with today. Here's what I have. I stand on the truth of God's word and I bring a simple plea to you. Don't leave here today unchanged. Don't continue to walk down the wide path that leads to destruction but turn to the narrow path, the narrow road that leads to life. And so I want you to think about the same question that this crowd would have been asking themselves. What needs to change? And maybe for some of you, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And maybe today you need to make the decision to confess your sins, to repent and put your faith in Jesus and have a real relationship with him. Maybe some of you, you've been following a false gospel and you need to turn back to the truth, to the one way that provides life. Or maybe there's some things in your life that need to be removed some actions and habits that need to change in order for you to see and get this fulfillment of life, this fulfillment and fullness that Jesus provides. Look, whatever that looks like for you, here's how every single one of us respond to this. We humble ourselves before God. We confess our sins. We repent in obedience. And we profess, we profess our faith. It's that simple. It's just not easy. So here's the deal. Following Jesus, the cost isn't just high. It's everything. It will cost you your life. But it's worth it. See, the truth of Jesus, it's upside down. But as hard of a message as it is to hear, it's hope. Because in death, you find life. So you can't change the truth of Jesus. But you can let the truth of Jesus change you. So the question you've got to ask yourself today is, will you let it? Let's pray.